Section 5.6 is on exponents and scientific notation. So there are a few properties, rules of exponents. The first property is called the product rule. And as an example, let's say I'm just gonna make up a random example here, but let's say that I have three squared and I wanna times it by three cubed or to the third power. Whenever I say the word base, by the way, in this video, I'm referring to the number that's holding up the exponent. So the base for this first example would be three. So whenever you're multiplying matching bases, the rule is that we add the exponents. So I keep the base, the number holding up the exponent the same, which is a three, and then I add the exponent. So two plus three. So this is, two plus three is obviously five. So this is really three to the fifth power. And then you can number crunch it out from there, but the idea is when you multiply the same base, you add the exponents. And you probably remember this rule from algebra, especially if you've had an algebra course recently. You use this rule a lot with variables, like with the letter x. Like if I had x uh, to the fourth times, I'll use a dot for times over here, x to the third, that would be x to the, again, when you're multiplying the same base, in this case the base is x, you add the exponent, so 4 plus the 3 for 7, so that would be x to the seventh power. The next property of exponents is called the power rule. So let's take the same base as I had originally, which is three, and let's say that I have three squared again, but I'm raising an exponent to another exponent or to another power, hence why they call it the power rule. So now I have an exponent floating above another exponent. There's no matching base, there's only one base of three, but whenever you're raising an exponent to another exponent, you no longer add the exponents together, you multiply them instead. So I would still keep the same base, which is three, but now take two and times it by that three. So multiply the exponents whenever you have an exponent raised to another exponent. And when I do that, I do two times three for, of course, six. So this would be three to the sixth power. And then you could number crunch it out from there. But again, power rule, exponent raised to exponent means multiply the exponents. Next up is the quotient rule. Quotient, of course, refers to division. So this is, in a sense, the opposite of the product rule that we discussed earlier. So if product rule was when you multiply matching bases, you add the exponents, quotient rule is if you divide matching bases, you subtract the exponents. So if I had three to the third power divided by, fraction bar means the same as division, so fraction bar divided by three to the second power. Now we still keep the base, the number holding the exponent the same, but we subtract. We do the exponent on the top, which is three, and we subtract the exponent on the bottom, which is two in this case. So this would be, keep the same base, which is three, three minus the two, which is one. So this is three to the first power. So when you're dividing the same base, you subtract the exponents. Exponent on top of the fraction bar divided by exponent on the bottom. And we're gonna do a bunch of examples here in a second. This table is just an introduction to all these exponent properties. 
And then finally, the other property to be on the lookout for is the zero exponent rule. There's this really oddball rule from algebra that if you have any number other than zero, I'll just pick three again because I'm not very creative. <laughs> but if you have any number in the world other than zero, raised to the zero power or raised to the zero exponent, it surprisingly does not equal zero, it equals one. And if you don't believe me, punch it into a calculator. So pick any number in the world, raise it to the zero power, and it equals one. The official rule, if you open up your textbook, which by the way, you can access the ebook in this course through my math lab, is if you have B to the zero power, it equals one. As long as that base, that B, is not zero itself. So any number in the world besides zero raised to the zero power surprisingly equals one, does not equal zero. Okay, so keeping that all in mind, example one, we're gonna simplify the following. And I have A, B, and C on this slide, but then I went a little example happy and there are more examples on the next slide. Starting with A says seven, to the zero power, or as we just stated above, any number besides zero raised to the zero power is one. B, same idea, negative five raised to the zero power. The negative sign is inside the parentheses, which means I'm gonna apply the zero exponent to the negative sign as well. So that is going to equal one as well. And then of course, it's my math lab, so they're gonna try little tricks and amp it up here and there. When I look at C, the negative sign is not in parentheses. So that means I'm only going to apply the zero exponent to the five. So even though five to the zero power is one, I bring the negative sign over for negative one. So the final answer for C is negative one. So if your negative sign is in parentheses, apply the exponent to it, like we did in B. So that negative five to the zero power was one. But if it's like C in the homework, the negative sign is not in parentheses, you're only going to apply the exponent to the whole number, which was five, and then bring the negative sign over which makes your final answer negative. So negative one for C. Looking at D, it wants us to do four times four squared. Please keep in mind when you see a number but no exponent, we can assume it's to the first power. So that first four we see without an exponent, we're gonna assume that's to the first power. So this question is actually saying four to the first times four squared. When we multiply and the bases match, remember bases means the number holding up the exponent, which in this case is four. So I have a matching base of four. When you're multiplying and we have the matching bases, we add the exponent. So I bring over the base of four, but I'm gonna do one plus the other exponent, which is two. which obviously one plus two for three. So this is four to the third power. You can either do this in your head or you could punch it into the calculator. Four cubed, just keep in mind what it means, especially if you are gonna do it in your head. Four cubed means four times four times four. So the exponent just signifies repeated multiplication. It's how many times we multiply that number together. So three fours, and when you do four times four times four, you do get 64 as the final simplified answer. Just as a reminder, the exponent button, also known as the caret, is right here on the graphing calculator. It's right above the division button. 
So for that last example, 4 to the third power, 4, up arrow, 3, enter for equals, enter was on the bottom right corner, and there's that 64. That was the product rule of exponents that we did for D. E, similar, if we get 4 to the fifth power, times 4 to the negative third, right here. So matching bases, we're multiplying, so it still means to add the exponents. So keep the base of the 4, 5, plus the other exponent is a negative 3. So when I have 5 plus negative 3, that's actually going to be 2 because positive times a negative, if you want to multiply the signs together, positive times negative is actually negative. So 5 plus a negative 3 would be the same as saying 5 minus 3. That's 4 to the second power. 4 to the second power or 4 squared would be 16 as the final answer. Now let's take a look at f. So f, we're dividing. Remember, fraction bar just means division. That's the quotient rule of exponents. So when we divide the same base, we subtract the exponents. So I keep the base of 4. Now just be careful with the quotient rule because it's always exponent on top of the fraction minus exponent on the bottom. It doesn't always go big to small. So in this case, the exponent on top is a 5 minus the exponent on the bottom is a 3. So I do 5 minus the 3. Just like the last example, it ends up being a 2. And I have 4 squared for 16 yet again. Final answer. So G, notice I switched it up a little bit here. I have the smaller exponent on top. That's okay. We're dividing. Quotient rule again. So I keep the base of 4. Exponent on top is a 3 this time. Minus exponent on the bottom is a 5. Here's where it's going to look a little different. It's a little bit of a harder question. When I do 3 minus 5, I have a negative 2 as my exponent. That doesn't even make any sense. 4 to the positive 2 power makes sense because remember, exponent shows us repeated multiplication. But how do I take a number and raise it to a negative exponent? How do I times it by itself a negative amount of times? It doesn't make any sense. So there's a little bit of a fix to correct this issue because it's just improper notation in mathematics to leave your answer with a negative exponent. We always want to correct that since it doesn't make any sense. And whenever you see a negative exponent, think fraction. So currently that four to the negative two power, if I wanted to make it into a fraction, I can always make any number in the world a fraction by putting it over one. And another kind of oddball rule you might remember from algebra, but the fix is, is any number to a negative power, move it to the opposite uh, side of the fraction. And this only works as long as there's only multiplication on the top and bottom. If there's any kind of plus or minus symbol on the top of the fraction, we would not be allowed to do this. But this 4 to the negative 2, the fix is move it to the bottom. And when I do that, it makes the exponent positive. So 4 to the negative 2, think reciprocal. So that moves to the bottom. The 4 is still the base, but negative 2 becomes positive 2. And after you move all your negative exponents, put a 1. If nothing is left, you can always just put a 1 as a placeholder. Or again, think reciprocal, so you're flipping that fraction upside down. And now that you've gotten rid of the negative exponent by flipping that over, now we can solve it out. So now I have a 1 in the numerator, 
and I have 4 to the positive 2 power, which is 16 on the bottom, or the denominator. So fraction, whenever you have a negative exponent, we're going to work with, and in this case, we get 1 16th as the final answer. We're going to do a few more with that negative exponent. So looking at h, it says 8 to the negative 2 power. So again, think exponent. As soon as you encounter a negative exponent, so I'm going to put it over 1, and the fix is it moves to the opposite part of the fraction. So if it's on the top, it moves to the bottom. Keep the base the same, which is 8. And as soon as you move it down, change the exponent to positive. So negative 2 becomes positive 2. Put a 1 on the top when you've moved everything to the bottom. So then now I have 1 on the top, and then 8 squared on the bottom is 64. So 1 64th is the final answer to h. Looking at i, 7 to the negative 1. Again, can't have negative exponents. we got to fix it. So we move it to the bottom of the fraction, the 7, and then the negative 1 exponent becomes positive 1. So you keep the exponent the same, you just change the sign as soon as you move it on down into the denominator. 1 is now the placeholder on the top, so 1 over 7 to the first power is just 7. And finally, j, 5 to the negative 3. Again, no negative exponents allowed. So move that 5 base to the bottom, negative 3 becomes positive 3, 1 on top, 1 over 5 cubed, or 5 times itself 3 times, is 125. So 1 over 125 is the final answer to J. You can also punch these into the graphing calculator to get a simplified answer. Just to show you how you would type in that last example, j, into the graphing calculator. So that was 5 to the negative 3 power. I type in the 5 first. Then I hit the exponent button right here above the division key. When it's a negative number and not subtraction, you have to use the negative sign on the bottom row. So I use the negative on the bottom row, 3. When I hit enter, it's a decimal, but they want a simplified fraction. So what's cool about the graphing calculator is it will convert and reduce fractions for you. Yay! So to do that, I'm going to use the math button. It's the third one down on the left side. It's under alpha. One, two, three, right here. So I hit the math button. I select frac, option one for fraction. It's already highlighted even. Option 1 or enter on 1, frac comes onto the main screen, and then I hit enter a second time, and bam, there it is, 1 over 125. So again, type in your question. You don't even need the decimal. Honestly, as soon as you type it in, you can hit math button, frac, option 1, enter again. Whoop. See what I did wrong there? I needed to get my cursor out of the exponent. Let me do it again. 5 to the negative 3. Here was the problem the last time. See how my cursor is floating as an exponent? Let's hit the right arrow key. There we go. So the cursor is back down on ground level. Then hit math, frac, enter. Or most students just memorize math button, enter twice to get these fractions. 1 over 125, final answer. The last couple of slides in this video practice going back and forth between scientific notation and decimal notation. Decimal notation meaning writing it as a normal number like we would see in everyday life. When a number is given to you in scientific notation, like in example two, it's very easy to identify because you'll see some number times 10 raised to an exponent. So for this homework, this is my math lab homework, when you see times 10 
to some exponent, you know they're giving you scientific notation to start with. Now, depending on which direction you are converting, if you're going from scientific notation to decimal notation or vice versa, the rules, the steps are completely different. So when we want to go from scientific notation to decimal notation, so from scientific notation to a normal looking number, we look at the sign on the exponent. So if we have a positive exponent, that tells us that we need to move right, and it tells us how far right to move the decimal point. However, if we see a negative exponent, that tells us how far left to move the decimal. So just think positive exponent, you're gonna move the decimal point to the right. Negative exponent, you're gonna move the decimal point to the left. And whatever the exponent number is, that's how many hops you're going to move the decimal point. So keeping that in mind, example two says to write each number in decimal notation. Starting with A, we have 7.4 times 10 to the ninth power. So I look at the sign of the exponent, it's a positive nine. Because it's a positive nine, that means we're gonna move the decimal point to the right nine hops. I'm gonna bring down the decimal, it was 7.4, and here we go, we're gonna move that decimal point right nine hops. So here's the first hop. When you run out of room to hop, that means we need to insert some zeros. So we've done one hop, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Plunk down your new decimal point and insert zeros as fillers wherever you ran out of room. Now I'm just gonna rewrite this number a little bit nicer. And it's gonna be easier to read if I insert a comma going backwards after every three digits. So here and here and here. So I see that this number is actually 7 billion 400 million as the final answer that I'm circling here for A. So the whole point of scientific notation is it either represents a very, very large number like here, or we'll see with example B here in a second, it represents a very, very small decimal number. So scientific notation is just a shorthand way of representing really large and really small numbers. But final answer, you would not type in the commas into my math lab, 7 billion 400 million. Nice, easy question. You're just looking at the exponent for going from scientific notation to a normal decimal notation number. Okay, looking at B, let me erase a little bit just to create some room. And then looking at B, now we have 3.017 times 10 to the negative 6 power. The exponent is negative, so now we're going to move the decimal point to the left. Negative 6 means left 6 hops. I'm going to bring down the original decimal in front of the time symbol. It was 3.017. And here we go. We're going to move the decimal point. We said left six hops. Here's hop number one, two, three, four, five, six. Fill in your new decimal point location. Wherever you ran out of room, fill in zeros as the placeholder. So you should have point one, two, three, four, five zeros, point five zeros, three zero one seven. And I'm gonna write this a little bit neater. One, two, three, four, five, three zero one seven. You could type it in just like that into the My Math Lab. Uh, if you're in a science course, your science instructor is going to want you to put a zero in the whole number spot as well. That just really emphasizes the location of the decimal point. 
You don't have to type that into my math lab, but just something to be aware of for science courses. So we see a negative exponent represents a decimal when we're going from scientific notation into our decimal system. Taking a look at C, C we actually have a whole number rather than a decimal. We have 8 times 10 to the 7th power. It's a positive 7, so we're going to move right 7 hops. Let me bring down the whole number, which is 8. If you do not see a decimal point, you can safely assume the decimal is currently sitting at the end, so after the 8. And now I need to move that decimal. We said right 7 hops. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Plunk down the new decimal point. Insert the zeros. So we have an 8 followed by 7 zeros, which is going to be the same, if I write it a little bit neater here, as 80 million. Again, you do not type in the commas into my math lab. I'm just putting commas in because it's easier for me to read the number when I go backwards and I insert a comma after every three digits. So I can see then it's 80 million. And then finally, D. For D, we have 7.86 times 10 to the negative 4. It's a negative exponent. So we're back to moving the decimal point left. Since it's negative 4, we're going to move it left 4 hops. I bring down the decimal, 7.86. And here we go. Hop 1, 2, 3, 4. Insert the zeros accordingly. Rewrite it nicer so it's 0 0.000786. You could leave your answer like that. In science, you would put a zero in the whole number spot as well. Final answer for D. So you can probably guess what's coming next. Now we're going to work backwards. They're going to give us a normal number in our decimal system so that they're going to give us a decimal notation number and now we're going to convert it back into scientific notation so our answer is going to be some number times 10 raised to some exponent when we're converting in this direction it's a totally different game plan totally different rules totally different steps so now we're going to take a look at the number that's presented to us. And if we have a positive number that's smaller than 1, so in other words, if we have this decimal, this very tiny decimal that is smaller than 1, we're going to use a negative exponent on our 10. However, if we're given a positive number larger than 1, so if we're given this incredibly large number, then we're going to use a positive exponent on our number 10. So jumping into example 3, it says write each number in scientific notation. A, we got 7,410,000,000. So I see that scenario 2. I have a large number. It's larger than 1. So that means I'm going to use a positive exponent. For scientific notation, I want to move the decimal point. So it's going from left to right. It's after the first non-zero digit. So as I read this number from left to right, the first non-zero digit is a 7. If you don't see the decimal point, you can assume it's on the end, on the far right. So let's see how many hops I need to move the decimal point to get it so that it's right after the 7. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 hops. And I write that down. So count how many hops to move it to the proper spot for scientific notation after the first non-zero digit. 
Now we put that information together. So it's a positive exponent, it's nine hops. So that means we move the decimal point after the seven. So now it's seven point, bring down the four one. We don't need to write all these zeros if they're at the end of a decimal part. So leave it as 7.41. Scientific notation is always times 10. And we already said above, it's gonna be a positive nine exponent. So the final answer is 7.41 times 10 raised to the nine power. Now you might be going, but you move the decimal point to the left. Why is it a positive exponent? Remember, when we're going into scientific notation, when we're converting a number to scientific notation, we don't care about if we move the decimal left or right. That was on the last slide when we were working in the opposite direction. Converting to scientific notation, you're automatically going to use a positive exponent if you have a large number in the original question, if it's larger than one which is what we definitely had here, since we had 7 billion, 410 million. Let's try, try another one here, B, point, and then we have a ton of zeros, nine, two. So this is clearly a small number. We are given a decimal number that's smaller than one, which means we need a negative exponent. And you might want to have these rules, by the way, written down for when you go to take your test. And then let's count how many hops to move the decimal point to the correct location. So from left to right, as I look at that number, remember we want to place the decimal right after the first digit that is not a zero. So from left to right, the first digit I see that's not a zero would be nine. So I gotta move the decimal point after the nine. So here we go. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hops to move the decimal point after the nine. Let's put all the information together. So we've moved the decimal point after the nine, which means there's still a two. So that's 9.2. I don't need to keep any of these zeros that are in front of the nine. That's extra information now. It's always times 10 to some power if it's scientific notation. And in this case, it's negative eight is gonna be my exponent. Again, we do not care the direction we move the decimal point. That's only when we're going from scientific notation to decimal notation. That's not what we're doing here. Now we're going in the reverse direction from decimal to scientific notation. So putting the information together, we get 9.2 times 10 raised to the negative eight power. Final answer, when you type this into my math lab, just don't ever, ever hit spacebar. Taking a look at C. So C, we have 220 million, which is scenario two. Clearly 220 million is a large number. It's larger than one which means we need a positive exponent. Step two, we take a look at how many hops to move the decimal point. I don't see the decimal point currently, so it must be sitting there on the end. It goes after the first digit that's not a zero, which would be the first two. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hops to move the decimal point right after that first two. So now it's 2.2. I don't have to rewrite any of these zeros at the end of a decimal part. So it's 2.2 times always 10 to the positive eight power for the final answer. And finally, D point, a bunch of zeros, 293. So we are back to having a small decimal number, smaller than one, which means we need a negative exponent. Step two, we skim from left to right to, to identify the first digit that's not a zero. That would be a two. 
and remove the decimal point immediately after that non-zero digit. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six hops. To accomplish that, let's rewrite the decimal point with its new location. So it's right after the two point, bring down the nine, three. You don't need to rewrite any of the zeros. Times, it's always times 10 for scientific notation raised to the negative six power. So you should have gotten 2.93 times 10 to the negative six, final answer.